So as I mentioned a little earlier, the focus of today's message is that of grief and loss. Grief can be a difficult subject to many people due to it being such a personal, subjective, and painful experience. You've heard it said that there are two subjects that we should never talk about, and that's uh, religion and politics. Well, grief also tends to make it up there on that list. In fact, it's so unspoken about that it doesn't even come up on the list about of things not to talk to. It really has, in a lot of cases, become the new taboo subject. So, as I said earlier, we're going to go there today. First of all, it should be noted that the biggest areas of grief that we tend to experience is death, the death of a person or pet, which can trigger so many painful and powerful emotions. However, grief is not simply the result of death. It comes about as the result of change. There are many areas of change that we might go through, which leads us to experiencing grief. Relationships ending, moving to a new location, injuries that lead us to not be able to do activities that we once found meaningful or found community in, and even social options that may no longer be available to us. It's important to recognize that even as we give up our substance of choice, there is a potential that we might be moving away from people that we once considered friends who would drink or use with us. Or even as we move into recovery, we may begin to grieve the relationships that we ignored or burnt bridges with when we were actively drinking or using. Grief is real and grief is related to change. And with any change, there can be times of struggle. Struggle with the unknown, growth and pain. And it's that pain that we don't like. Paired with the unfamiliarity of the unknown, we seek to avoid the pain. Now this can lead back to so many different behaviors or substances um, that we might start taking again in order to avoid that pain. We may retreat into ourselves or even become caretakers to other people, you know, managing their grief and taking care of them and taking care of all the details that need to be taken care of in the hope that we can avoid our own grief and hoping that by the time we do get to the point where we can try and look at our own grief that we're so far removed from the event of whatever happened that we won't have to do any processing at all. But unfortunately, as we all probably know, that's not how grief works. And learning to see grief as something different than the pain of the loss is where we can start. As my grief and loss mentor David Kessler would say, grief isn't the enemy here. Grief is actually not what you're struggling with. The pain of the loss is what you're struggling with. And grief is the gift that you get to process the pain of the loss. So let me say that again. Grief is the gift that you get to process the pain of the loss. The thing is though, as we try and push this gift away, we don't seem to realize that the pain will not go away. But instead, it's going to continue to build up inside of us. We might be able to numb it out for a time or distract ourselves for a time, but it will still be there. And eventually, it's going to start coming out sideways. Logically, we know some of the reasons why grief hurts so much. And it varies depending on our situations. It could be, for example, in the death of someone, that we loved that person and we wanted more time with them. On the other hand, it could be because we had a difficult relationship with them and, and whether it was unfinished business or something else. The unresolved attachment, even to our struggles in that relationship, 
can be the thing that creates a different level of grief dynamic within us. In his book, Care of the Soul, Thomas More writes about the difference between spirit and soul. Spirit, he says, is the part of us which inspires, plans, sets goals, and prefer prefers to detach. Whereas soul delves deeply into the complexities. It values deep conversations. It values its attachment to people and places and things that we find meaningful. This becomes important because in a recovery culture, especially when we're encouraged to look at things objectively and to rely on our rational thinking, the pain of the loss challenges this. And it's actually the grief, which is the gift that allows us to experience some grace and lets us know that it actually is okay for us to experience our own messy, subjective emotions around the area of loss. So in recovery, where we're taught the spirit-based response of trying to be objective, we're also challenged to go deeper into the soul and to begin to find the attachments to connect to a home group, healthy people in the rooms, and to find a place of belonging in this new culture. So these attachments to meaningful people, places, and things in our lives is a normal part of our soul's journey. Even when we've had a complicated relationship with someone, we still often experience that attachment due to the anger or unfinished business that we may have had, leading to further complex emotions. So when a death or change occurs, and that pain wells up within us. This is also a normal part of our human experience. It's also important to add, however, that another normal part of the human experience is that we are hardwired to avoid pain. For example, this is another example that David Kessler shares. If a child is told not to touch a hot stove, and they do it anyway, that'll likely be the last time they touch that hot stove. We react to the pain and try to avoid it or displace it. And our brains sometimes cannot tell the difference between the physical pain and the emotional pain. All we know is that we feel pain and we want to avoid it. And so our animal instincts kick in. Think about it. When an animal is in the wild and it's in pain, it recognizes it's vulnerable. So it crawls away, it isolates, it hides until it's either healed or it dies. It does not want to leave itself open to being vulnerable. How many of you all can relate to that? Right, exactly. As humans, when we feel pain, whether emotional or physical, we also want to avoid it. But when it comes to the emotional pain, avoidance only leads to it getting bigger and more overwhelming as the time progresses. Another important thought about the subjectivity of grief is that we all do grieve differently. Sometimes we may want to have our grief witnessed by someone who has experienced that same grief, a significant other, maybe a sibling or parent or friend. But their grief process may look very different than ours because their relationship with, in this case, someone who's died, was as unique as your own relationship and looked very different. And their personality may lead them to a different grief process entirely. I want you to really listen to this part, okay? Sometimes when we expect someone who is emotionally unavailable to our grief needs, when we expect them to be emotionally available, 
we end up self-sabotaging ourselves and ultimately we don't get what we need. It causes us more pain when we reach out to someone who is emotionally unavailable to us. And so as much as we may want to crawl or away or hide or isolate, we have learned that this experience also only serves to hijack us and any good work we have done on ourselves and our soul. So it becomes imperative that we find the support that we need for people who are willing to listen to our experiences or to join us in those experiences, to find the people who are emotionally available to us. And this leads me to one of the quotes from the earlier readings. It said, I recall that often the difference between suffering which destroys us and suffering which transforms us begins with the presence of a caring, thoughtful other who is willing to acknowledge that brokenness with us. Even in the midst of what may be a confusing time as we work through the potentials for many changes in our lives, Finding that support person or people is essential. As human beings, we are hardwired not only to avoid pain, but we are hardwired also to seek meaningful connection with others. Again, soul work. If those others are, as I said, emotionally unavailable to us, the pain of the loss is going to be too overwhelming for us. But if we find that caring, thoughtful other, the person who is willing, without judgment, to be there with us, to walk with us into the valley of our deepest pains, fears, and hurts, then the pain of our loss will get witnessed and over time transformed. The grief will always be a part of our life, but with time, our lives will continue to grow. And even though the grief takes up that same space in our hearts, our soul will grow enough to eventually be able to manage it. You'll be brave enough to cry at the loss or laugh at some of the memories and to cherish the time that was given with us. Over time, our grief will not become smaller, but it will become softer. And conversely, for those who are reeling from the death of someone who is not a healthy figure for you, who may have been abusive or neglectful, who may have left you with no opportunity to find closure, your feelings are still valid and unique. More importantly, it is possible to hold both anger, even indifference, and grief, all at the same time. Find someone who is willing to walk into that space with you, to meet you where you are. Your anger, indifference, and grief are still valid. In our own individual journeys of grief, it's essential that we learn what well, we need to take care of ourselves and to keep those willing to accompany us on this journey close by. I will also want to share a quote that was read earlier as well, because this refers to our higher power. If we're struggling, it's okay to be in that struggle. It may feel uncomfortable, but that is because that struggle is not simply uncomfortable, it's unfamiliar. We're struggling with what is an unknown situation, a new situation, an overwhelming situation. Sometimes when it comes down to the idea of the need to blame or, you know, displace this onto someone else, that's a normal part of the grief process as well. And we will talk a little bit about that in a few moments. But when it comes to a higher power, sometimes people feel afraid to show their full emotions to their higher power. And I want to remind you what was said earlier. 
Remember this, your higher power isn't scared of any of your big emotions. Your higher power understands every single one of them. Higher power is with you, walking by your side, and higher power's love will never let you go. Even if you're blaming higher power for what happened, even if you're angry with higher power, even if you don't give to whatever's about that higher power with you or not, its love is not gonna let you go. Its love is not gonna let you go. And as we go through our journey of grief, several feelings can come up also that take us by surprise. Again, the anger, the blame. Some of these might include feeling relieved. Now this isn't uncommon, especially when a person has been suffering or when we may have been the primary caregiver for someone and have become burnt out in that process, potentially even resentful at the caretaking. This might in turn lead to feelings of guilt. Please remember that your feelings, even feelings of relief or resentment, have valid foundations. You are only human after all, and you are likely ignoring your own needs or numbing yourself so you didn't have to feel the complex range of emotions that were coming up within you. Another very common emotion that practically all people experience is bargaining. In a lot of cases, this comes up as the woulda, coulda, shoulda. If only I'd have done X, then Y would have happened, or maybe it wouldn't have happened. We second guess ourselves, hindsight being 2020, and believe we could have done something to change the events of what happened. Our feelings of guilt related to this woulda, coulda, shoulda thinking actually stems from a primary source of helplessness. When we feel guilt, we feel like we had some power to do something different. That something else could have been done, but maybe we could have done something and it would have led to a different outcome. But when we feel helpless, there's a sense of mystery, of unknown and a realization that we didn't have the power to change anything. David Kessler, again, my grief and loss guru, he explains this very well. He says, we would rather feel guilt and feel as if we had the sense of control over something that we ultimately did not have control over and feel helpless and recognize that we had no control over that situation. It takes strength to face grief. It takes strength to feel grief. It takes guts to allow ourselves to become vulnerable and to reach out to find those caring, thoughtful others. Putting our fears aside and recognizing the grief is actually a form of grace in disguise. The gift to work through the pain of whatever change that we have experienced. It takes strength to walk this journey. And it takes as much strength to walk this journey with someone else. Whether to accompany them in their grief or whether to invite them into your own grief. Ernest Hemingway, and later adapted by Banksy, said something about death which is really meaningful and important to remember. Every person has two deaths, when they are buried in the ground and the last time someone says their name. In some ways, people can be immortal. Grief is a gift because it's an expression of our, of our love and of our soul's connection to whoever or whatever it is that we're holding on to, including love, sorrow, or even anger and the pain that arises from the loss that we have experienced. When we grieve, we remember 
and we grieve, we say their names. When we stop our feelings and try and push that pain aside, we're pushing aside all of what that person meant to us, whether love or even other complex feelings. However you may feel about grief, simply allow yourself to feel. Maybe it's tears, maybe it's not tears. Tears are not the sole expression of grief. Some people don't cry without stuffing it, and that's okay. Maybe it's stoical reflection. Maybe it's something that has to come through ritual. But allow yourself to risk being open to whatever that feeling may be and find yourself caring. Find yourself your caring, thoughtful community of support to assist you in that process. And as you find that caring, thoughtful group of others, so your journey and story may help someone that you meet that has had a similar experience along the way. And you may in turn become that caring, thoughtful other to someone else. Be willing and open to experiencing the grace that comes through the gift of grief.